Sometimes you just have to recognize that and stop in that, you know. And it's not just when you're in a church service. That's any time. Any time. The Holy Spirit should be able to interrupt you at any time and say, I'm here. It's time to stop. Amen. I, you know, sometimes I make the mistake of thinking that when I go somewhere, I'm bringing the Holy Spirit with me as if the Holy Spirit wasn't already there. And to be reminded the Holy Spirit is at work everywhere. And I'm going, we go to these places to discern what the Holy Spirit's already doing and to partner with the work of the Holy Spirit. Do you think the Holy Spirit's not at work in our world today? He's at work. He's at work in the world. Can we discern what he's doing and join with him? Well, I'm excited to be continuing uh, our series today as we continue to spend time in the Psalms. Last week, we spent time in Psalm 139, and we're talking about anxiety, and we were exploring how David was facing an anxious situation, but that David faced that anxious situation by rooting himself, not in things that are temporal, but rooting rooting himself in things that are eternal. Jesus talked about that too. He says, when you root yourself or when you dig, you know, put your house, the life of your house, uh, your life as a house on a foundation of shifting sand, what happens when the storm comes? You must build your house upon the rock. And so David roots himself in that which is eternal, which was God and his character. It's not going to change. It's eternal. David roots himself in the reign of God and roots himself in the kingdom of God, a reign which will never end and a kingdom that is everlasting. So today we're going to continue our conversation and talk about something a little bit different. So rather than the context of anxiety, anxiety is still part of the picture here, we're going to be talking about the context of threat, things that would threaten us. Now, things that threaten us can cause anxiety, but we're kind of focusing on threat. And we're going to do that with Psalm 91, pointing us in the direction of a statement that I'd hope we can unpack in, in our time together. Very similar to a statement that Brandon uh, brought to us a couple weeks ago, and Brandon did a wonderful job uh, preaching, his first time preaching in front of the church uh, on a topic of money, no less, and did a fabulous job. And, uh, and I, he thanked me for that, and I saw all that afterwards. Um, he said something that is still sticks with me. I'm still thinking about it. He said, what you love determines how you love. Do you remember him saying that? And Brandon was saying that when you love the things of the world, then that will affect how you love. And he said, and conversely, when you love uh, the things of heaven, God, and the things of uh, eternal things, that will also affect how you love. So today we want to explore a similar statement, and that is this. How you see the world determines how you live in the world. How you see the world determines how you live in the world. And as we explore that, we'll be doing that with uh, the psalm that came as the, uh, the, the kind of the number two psalm that the congregation would turn to for comfort after Psalm 139, and that is Psalm 91. So if you have uh, your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn there to Psalm 91. Um, anyways, on the screen, I want you to stand as we read the Word of God together. Now, the reason why we stand is to honor God's Word in its reading. This is the Word of the Lord. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks at the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent. For He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. 
They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra, and you will trample on the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, and this is the Lord speaking, because he loves me, I will rescue him. I will protect him from the, uh, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him uh, in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord remains forever. Please be seated. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of your word. We thank you that it is God-breathed and authoritative in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that when it speaks, we place ourselves under its authority in all things. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you be with us to teach us, guide us, comfort us, and confront us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So as we explore the question, or the, I'm sorry, explore the statement, how you see the world determines how you live in it. We want to do that using three questions. One, why does it matter? Why does it matter how you see the world? And even maybe you come at it, maybe it doesn't matter. We want to ask, does it matter how you see the world? Why does it matter? And then two follow-up questions, how should you see the world? And then secondly, uh, or thirdly, actually, how should you live in the world? So why does it matter? How should you see the world? And then why should, how should you live in the world? So we'll start by saying, why does it matter? Does it really matter how you see the world? Maybe it's a little bit of an overblown statement. Why does it matter how you see it? And again, we're taking up the context of threat. Does it matter if you fundamentally see the world as threatening? Or does it matter if you fundamentally see yourself as secure in the world? Does that matter? And I want to suggest today that it does. And that the reason why it matters is a matter of biology. We mentioned last week in Psalm 139 that you're fearfully and wonderfully made, that God knit you together in the secret places in your mother's womb and that God has made you with a purpose, and each part of your body has a purpose. And one part of your body, probably the most powerful perhaps, is your brain. And at the base of your brain, it's the lowest part of your brain, is something called the amygdala. The amygdala is something that you share in common with other animals, even reptiles. Reptiles have an amygdala. It's about the size of a grape, not very big, but it's powerful. The amygdala is the part of your brain, does many other things, but one of the things it does is scan the environment for stimuli that would come into the, you know, perception that would be determined to be threatening. In essence, the amygdala is kind of like a smoke detector of your body, of your self. And think about how a smoke detector works in your house. A smoke detector, you have them in your house, I hope, and I hope they have batteries in them that work, right? That's important. And the smoke detector largely is not work. It largely just is silent, it's dormant, doesn't do much. Until it detects something in the environment, in this case smoke or CO2 or whatever it is that it detects, that would be threatening. And once that smoke detector determines something's threatening, what does it do? It goes off and it's loud and it needs to be loud uh, because it's something very threatening in the environment and anybody within the purview of that smoke detector stops whatever it's doing and looks, right? What's going on and scans the environment for threat. Well, that's what the amygdala does. The amygdala scans the environment for threat and when it turns on, it turns on because something has come into your perception that is perceived to be a danger. And when it turns on, it gets your body ready very fast to deal with that dangerous situation usually in one of three ways, fight, flight, or freeze. So for instance, when you see uh, sometimes a deer crossing the road, it stops, or sometimes you get a situation and you freeze, that's your amygdala, it's, it's reacting that way. So fight, flight, or freeze. And that's a good thing, we need the amygdala. We need to be able to react very quickly when something threatening comes at us. One time I was driving home, uh, speaking of deer, one time I was driving home late night uh, in Colorado from a late night wedding gig, and I was, I should have stayed the night, but I was playing a church gig the next day. So I'm driving home, it's after midnight, I-70 in the mountains, I'm falling asleep. And so I pull off the side of the road to get what everybody gets when they're driving when they're falling asleep. And what is that? Red Bull. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe it should be coffee, but at the time it was a Red Bull anyway. Um, 
So I get a Red Bull, right? So I'm trying to stay awake. So I'm driving, you know, I, I'm falling asleep. So I, I, I'm, you know, drinking it with one hand. This hand's here. There's nobody on the road. And I look up and I see three deer in the middle of the interstate. And when you're late at night and it's the, you know, the headlights, it's not like there's a lot of time between me and what these deer. And I'm already going like 70 miles an hour because it's the interstate. So what happens? My amygdala turned on. And I don't even remember what I did. I, well, I do kind of, but I didn't, I didn't think about it. Because when your amygdala is turned on, the other part of your brain, which is the thinking part, called the medial prefrontal cortex, which deals with language and rational thinking, shuts down. Because you don't have time to think when you're threatened. I don't remember. I, don't, I didn't rationally think about it. I just reacted. And what I did, when I reacted, I turned into the deer and went in between them. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Should have been a race car driver, apparently. I don't know. Now, afterwards, when I, on the other side of that, when I kind of came to, in a sense, because it was subconscious, I wasn't thinking about what I did. I just reacted. My heart was going like this. My body's ready to go. I'm awake now. And Red Bull was everywhere, you know. <laughs> so my car was sticky for like two months. But, the, but, but that's how the amygdala works. We're, we're, thank God for the amygdala. We need it. Now, the, the way the amygdala should work is that it turns on, it, it, you deal with the threat, and then it should turn off again. It's not meant to be on. Imagine a smoke detector that won't turn off. That's super annoying. And actually, you can't live life in your house with a smoke detector going off, yes? Can you imagine living in a house with a smoke detector going off? You can't live in that house. Well, what happens sometimes when we view our world as fundamentally threatening for all sorts of reasons, right? We can be physically threatened, we can be emotionally threatened, um, we can be threatened kind of a, a, as an environmental th uh, threat. Uh, when I, well, it's more emotional, but sometimes societal and things like that. When, when we perceive the world as fundamentally threatening, then our amygdala doesn't get the signal that it should stop working. Because I'm always trying to survive. I'm, I'm in a survival mode with what's going on around me. This is how PTSD will work. So PTSD, you go through a traumatic event, and then after the traumatic event is done, you continue to perceive the world as threatening, and different things kind of trigger that. And so your amygdala is kind of working, and it, and it shuts things down. That's why people have to, to deal with that. And when the amygdala doesn't turn off, this is very damaging. It's like the smoke detector in your house that won't turn off. It's damaging physically because you have adrenaline pumping through you when it shouldn't be doing that all the time. You have cortisol stress kind of hormones going through you. This is why when you go to the doctor and you have like headaches a lot or maybe sometimes with cancers and other sicknesses, they'll ask you not about physical things, they'll ask you about stress. How's the stress of your life? You ever had people, doctors ask, how's, how's your stress level? The reason why they're asking that is what they're asking is your amygdala is turned on because your, your stress level is such that you have a lot of hormones, things going through your body that shouldn't be, and it's breaking your body down, hence you're sick. So it's not good for you physically. It's also not good for you emotionally. It's not good for the way we think and act in the world, because that's what we're saying. How do we act in the world? For all sorts of reasons, uh, just to give you a, a few, one is called imaginative gridlock that people who are dealing with the world is fundamentally threatening and the amygdala is always kind of working. Remember that part of our brain that deals with language and thinking is largely not operating. So we're not thinking as clearly. We tend to focus away from ourselves to external factors. When you're trying to survive, someone comes at you with a gun, you're not gonna ask the question of, like, what did I do to get us in this situation, right? You're saying, how do I get out of this? So when you're always feeling like you're threatened, you tend to focus on external things. You don't tend to focus on internal things. You get very defensive, which because you're in a survival, you're trying to survive this thing. You start blaming people. You start to think of people either as enemy or friend or foe, either or kind of thinking, black and white. It decreases your capacity to learn, again, because that, you know, your brains aren't, aren't functioning uh, as quite to capacity. And it demands, uh, increases demand for certainty. Are you for me or are you against me? Are you my friend or are you my foe? You don't deal with ambiguities when you're trying to survive. And these behaviors are not healthy. It's not healthy for us physically. It's not healthy for us emotionally. So when we deal with the world and perceive it as fundamentally threatening, and our amygdala is working in a way that uh, it, it won't turn off like the smoke detector that's always going, this isn't good for us in any way. 
It isn't good for us in any way. So that goes, then the further question, okay, if we are not, if it's not healthy for us to fundamentally, consistently see the world as a threatening place where I'm always trying to survive all the time because that has those effects, how should we see the world? Because am I suggesting that it's all safe out there and it's all rosy and nothing bad happens? Is that what I'm saying? Is that what the Bible says? How should you see the world? I would suggest that you would see the world Well, let me turn to the Scriptures, then I'll say it. Psalm 91, the first two verses say this. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my safe place, my God in whom I trust. Uh, Pastor Tweedy this last week was talking about, I see him back there, talking about playing freeze tag. When you play freeze tag, sometimes you have a home base, right, that place where you're always safe, right? The Lord is your safe place. He's your shelter. You rest in his shadow. That image, uh, you think about Jesus saying, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you together uh, like a mother hen, you know, the chicks under her wings. And that's that language of shelter and shadow. It's that kind of picture. But if you need shelter, what do you need shelter from? A storm. Right? If you need to find refuge, you're finding refuge from something that's coming against you. So the Bible's very realistic that the world is not exactly like nothing bad can ever happen. That Jesus says, when you're in the world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart, for I've overcome. So I think we need to distinguish what it means to be secure and to see the world as a place where I can be secure in the world versus safe. Even think about C.S. Lewis. How do you describe Aslan? Did he say Aslan was safe? Is Aslan safe? He ain't. Is he good? He's good, but he isn't safe. So let's talk about security. To be secure would mean freedom from fear. Now think about it. When you're saved, Jesus or the Bible tells you, I've saved you for freedom, and I did not give you a spirit of fear. I did not give you a spirit of fear. But does that mean there is no risk in the world? That's the difference between maybe security and safety. Maybe safety can be defined as freedom from danger or risk. So can you exist in the world and be secure? Does that mean you're always going to be free from any kind of danger or risk? Think about Psalm, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah, where he says, when you pass through the waters, well, I'll be with you. When you pass through the fire, you will not be burned. That recognizes fire and, and water are things that would come against you. But lo, you're not alone, and you are secure. The Bible wants to tell you, yes, this, in the world there is risk and there is exposure to danger, but don't be afraid. Don't see the world as fundamentally threatening to you because you are secure in Christ. As an example, let's say, I uh, want to show you again the idea that this, even Psalm 93 says that there is danger out there. He says, look, I'll save you from the fowler snare and the deadly pestilence, something we can certainly relate to today, yeah? The Bible is realistic about the world. There is snare, there is pestilence, but lo, I will save you. Lo, you are secure in the world. Another example is Psalm 3. Psalm 3, David is facing threat, right? We're talking about threat today. In Psalm 3, David says, Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. David is being threatened physically by people. Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. So not only is David being threatened physically, he's being threatened emotionally. People are saying he's not even a Christian, he's in our sort of language. He's not even a believer. God's rejected him. So David's being threatened. Now, how does David respond to the threat? But you, O Lord, are a shield about me. You are my refuge, right? You are my glory, he says. You are the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. And then he says something interesting. He says, I lay down and slept, and I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. Why is David talking about sleep? One of the ways you can know that you are living in the world where you're fundamentally viewing it as threatening is when your mind won't shut off. Have you ever had sleepless nights where your mind just won't stop? Because you're playing over and over and again scenarios that you find threatening to you? This last week, I, I felt that way. I'd, some, some nights where my mind would not shut off. You wake up at 3 in the morning and your mind won't stop thinking because I'm imagining threats that are against me. 
When that's happening, I need to stop and go, my mind is racing because I am fundamentally feeling something in my environment is a threat to me. I'm not taking refuge in God in this. David says, I lay down and slept, and I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. And then he says, and I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. There is no threat. Now, the threat's real to David. It's a real threat. But there's no threat that will move David out of a sense that I am secure. I am secure in the Lord. I I see the world as fundamentally a place where I am secure, although I am threatened. So I can sleep at night. I don't have to wrap my brain and constantly be, you know, that gut, that, that, that feeling in your gut that I'm being threatened. David says, I don't have to deal with that. Let me just uh, give you another example, and this hopefully can tie into what we, the, really the question is, where are you finding your refuge, really? Where, where is your refuge? Where, where is your security found? They did uh, observations of children, and uh, children in relation to their parents, and when they would go to a park or something like that, the child would be put down, and uh, the child would begin to play, kind of explore their environment, and the child would do that, and, and periodically, the child would turn around and make a connection with their, like, mom, you know, the mom, and to make sure the mom was there, and make sure the mom was paying attention. And if the mom was paying attention and kind of made a connection with the child, the child would continue to play and continue to explore. Now, if the, if the, if the child was there and began to explore and turn around and the mother was ignoring the child, maybe doing something else, or the mother even was presenting signals of upsetness with the child, you know, in some way, the child would recoil, would no longer explore, would no longer be uh, playing, but would recoil and would come back and and kind of almost get smaller. And what they noticed, and this is a, a wonderful book called The Body Keeps the Score, it says, if you feel secure and loved, your brain begins to specialize in exploration, play, and cooperation. If you are frightened, and unwanted, or you perceive that. It specializes in managing feelings of fear. Good question for you today. Do you find that in your life you are seeing the world as a place of exploration, play, and cooperation, or do you fundamentally see it as a place where you're afraid and you're managing feelings of fear? And that can demand, that can depend a lot on where you're finding your security. If, If today you're finding your security in the stock market, you might have reason to fear. That might not be a really great place to find your security ever. If you're finding your security in success, if you're finding your security in all sorts of things, and the things begin to threaten it, then those things begin to threaten you. Where you're finding your security, it matters. Children become attached to whatever functions as their primary caregiver. But the nature of that attachment, whether it is secure or insecure, makes a huge difference over the course of a child's life. If we are going to see the, the world as, as a place where we are secure, it's because we've become attached to our primary caregiver. And who is our primary caregiver? Jesus, God, our Heavenly Father. God is our primary caregiver. Now, when we, now, the question for you and for I, do we have a healthy attachment to our Father in Heaven as our primary caregiver? That's the question. Do you have that? If you are finding that you are finding your security or your, your attachment into something else, We talked about that last week, something that is temporal. Then that security, which is temporal, which can be threatened and taken away, that will also make a big difference in how you live your life. Is God your primary caregiver? Because then you can see the world as a secure place. I'm secure in my heavenly Father's hands. So then, as we end, how... Does that then change how we live? How should we live? If we see the world as a place where we are secure because we have a heavenly Father and we can't, no one can snatch us out of His hands, right, John 10, how then shall we live? I think this, the psalm presents a bit of a tension on how we live, and there's a tension between the two things that I'll present. One is that because we live in the world as a place where we are secure in God's hands, We live with boldness. We aren't people who are to live like timid, frightened children. We're to be bold and be bold for Christ. Here in Psalm 91, we read this, you will tread on the lion and the cobra, you will trample on the great lion and the serpent. Does that 
look like a description of someone who's timid? Absolutely not. This is someone who is bold. This is someone who understands that it's not my strength but the Lord's, and because of the strength of the Lord, I can be bold in a world where I am secure. It doesn't mean that there isn't danger or risk. And by the way, a life without danger or risk sounds incredibly boring. Can you imagine like watching, you know, Indiana Jones and the great, you know, whatever, and there's like no risk? It'd be super boring. Like, what a boring movie, you know. The fact that he has to, anyway. But we're bold because we're secure. Now, that's then held in tension with something else. We're bold, but we aren't to be foolish. We're bold, but not foolish. And it's interesting because the devil quotes Psalm 91 to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4, the evil one takes Jesus to the top of the temple. And together, they're looking down over this great height. And here's what the devil says to, to Jesus. He says, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. And then he quotes Psalm 91. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike a foot against a stone. Now, how does Jesus respond to the devil quoting our psalm this morning to him? Does he say, oh, good point. I should be bold. Let's go. He does not. Jesus says, it's also written, he recognizes that Jesus quoted, I mean, that the evil one quoted Scripture. There's no, you know, yeah, I got it. You've quoted me Scripture. But it's also written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Be bold, but be wise. Don't put your Lord your God to the test. Think about this. Like the world is like your kitchen. The kitchen is a wonderful place for wonderful creation. Unless you're in my house, and then for me, it's noodles with butter and, you know, red sauce. And that's it. My wife's a wonderful cook. I'm talking about when I cook. Okay, when I cook. Or it's ramen noodles. Something noodles, right? Anyway. But for most people, the, the, the kitchen is a wonderful place for exploration. You can make wonderful culinary delights. Can you imagine walking into a kitchen and, and be filled with fear? I'm afraid that that knife might hurt me. Is, are there dangers in the kitchen? Oh, yeah, there are. Be wise, you know, but this, you know, you, if you walk in, oh, I can't walk into this kitchen, I'm afraid. You're not going to make much. But be wise. If you, if you say, well, God's going to protect me from anything, nothing's going to happen to me, and you put your hand on a burning stove, well, God's going to protect me, boom. What's going to happen to your hand? You're going to get burned. Be bold, but be wise. Be wise. Don't be foolish. Don't put your Lord, your God, to the test. Be wise in the world, but be bold. Final story, then we'll close. I was thinking a lot about the Middle East this week and with what's going on in Beirut, and we, we spent some time in Jordan uh, with a wonderful ministry that does tremendous work among refugees. Now, in Jordan, it is illegal to evangelize for the Christian faith. Now, it is not illegal to be a Christian, it's not make that distinction. So they have Christian churches, they have crosses, and they exist, and, and nobody's coming to them, telling them to stop worshiping. So that's all fine. You can be a Christian in Jordan, and that's fine. But it is illegal to evangelize. So if you were to have a church service and you were to say, okay, today's message is why we're going to burn Qurans, and we're going to go out there, and we're going to tell everybody that Muhammad is a false prophet, and that you should all believe in Jesus. What will happen? The authorities will show up, you all get arrested, and your, your church is shut down. Now, be bold. Is that the right thing to do? This ministry that is there, they do tremendous work for the gospel. I have not seen more effective evangelism in my life than to see this ministry in Jordan do evangelism. But they are wise and they're bold. And they told us a story when we came. They said, we want you to be bold for Christ, but be wise. And there was a, they told us a story. There was a group that came in, and they wanted to be bold. We asked them to please respect the way that we do ministry here, given our context. 
Because if you want to go out there and be bold in a certain way, we'll get shut down. And all the ministry that we do and all the wonderful work and evangelism that we do will stop happening. So please, be bold but be wise. And this particular group decided that that was just, how do I put this? Not bold enough. How to say it. So they decided that they were going to go out and be bold. And they started saying a bunch of things, you know, publicly and everything, like denouncing this and that and Muslims and everything. And they were being bold. And they almost got that ministry shut down. So should we be bold? Yes. But should we be wise in how we live in the world? Jesus says this, and we'll close. Be in the world. Innocent as doves. Innocent as doves. But what? Wise as serpents. How you see the world determines how you will live in it. You and I in Christ are secure in this world. We can be bold, but may we have the discernment to be wise. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You that we have Jesus who was bold and wise. May we see Him as our Savior and our example. And Lord, we thank You that we don't have to see this world as fundamentally threatening. It's not that at times, Lord, we aren't threatened. And thank you, Lord, for a part of our brain that you designed, the amygdala, to help save us from those threatening situations. But, Lord, we pray that we would live in the world knowing that we are secure in the hands of a heavenly Father that knows us and loves us. And, Lord, may we be bold in the world. May we be people that carry forward the story of the life-giving gospel as Jesus is renewing all things all to himself, all things in heaven and earth. But would you give us the Holy Spirit to be wise as well so that we know when to speak and we know when to be silent. All for the glory of the name of the Lord Jesus, our strength and our very present help in times of trouble. We pray in his name. Amen.